and welcome to Lutherans Alive. My name is Gregory Held, and this is the program that brings you the story of Lutheran Christians and their ministries in southwestern Pennsylvania. With us today is a, a visitor who's been with us before. We didn't intimidate him, and he came back. Bishop Kurt Custero, thank you very much for being with us today. You're welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, the last time you were here, we had our first opportunity to talk about a recent visit to the Holy Land uh, with bishops of the Evangelical mm -hmm. Lutheran Church in America. Maybe we could start just by reminding people the context of that visit, and uh, then we can move into uh, the awareness aspect that we wanted to talk about today. Two years ago, Bishop Munib Yunan of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land invited our bishops in this country to have our academy there. And by the time the plans were made and the trip was taken, it became much larger than continuing ed. The three points of our trip were accompaniment and awareness and advocacy. Our accompaniment, of course, being with, and that was a big part of our trip to go in person and be with our fellow members of the body of Christ there. Then, of course, the second point being awareness is what we're talking about today. And that's learning, not only intellectual, but also emotional learning. And that's something that uh, was a very significant part of our trip, something that I appreciate very much and hope to bring back in many ways, one of which is our interview today. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, one of the things that was a part of that trip that you wanted to talk about uh, to emphasize the awareness was a visit to the Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. That reminds us that uh, some of the things that we can learn and, I guess, grow in our awareness um, are not necessarily things that are happening today, but have already happened, and the history and the, the witness are there waiting for us to become aware or more aware. Absolutely. That, that was Thursday morning, and we went with a couple of buses that we had to the Holocaust Museum. There were other buses there, uh, very crowded, a lot of people. Each of us had a tour guide. Mm. And the building itself was shaped in a way that brought the visitors from normal life into an unusual situation. The building began with carpeted lights and, and uh, modern day uh, experience. Everything was normal. Uh, but then as the building turned physically downward and we went downhill, the carpeting disappeared and the lighting and pretty soon we were in a place that was all concrete and uh, very unsettling. Then at the end of the tour, <clears throat> the building rose again up a ramp into Hope uh, at the other end. So the, the building itself was built in a way that led us through that difficult time and into Hope. Uh, really unique that the, the physical layout would actually be a part of telling the story and uh, uh, setting the setting for what you would experience. Uh, where again in the Holy Land is the Holocaust Museum located? It's in the city of Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And uh, for me, one of the most interesting things, speaking of awareness, was to see in the heart of it, in the, in the lowest part, they had a timeline of all the things that the Jewish people had experienced during the Holocaust mm -hmm. that ultimately led to what was called the ultimate solution, uh, which is the part that we know so well. That timeline began with a boycott of not to buy from the Jews. And in the moment that I looked at that first step on the timeline, I was reminded of the very emotional response that Jews in this country had to the Presbyterian Church's discussion of divesting from Israel as a sign of advocacy for the Palestinian people. Mm. And it wasn't until that moment that I saw step number one, not buying from the Jews, made me realize, of course, there would be a strong emotional response to that which was intended merely to be a financial uh, act of leverage. Right. Uh, and, and it's moments like that that I think, open our minds and our hearts to see and understand people in ways we couldn't have before. Mm. I'm sure many people wouldn't have remembered back to World War II. Uh, many of us were not mm. um, alive or of uh, memorable age, I guess you'd say, uh, at that point. But uh, that whole original conflict about uh, the Jewish folk who 
were successful in business and were looked at with suspicion. Yeah. And uh, as you say, that, those were the first steps. Uh, that started down that what we might call a slippery slope. That's exactly today. right. And even for those who were not alive then, that memory is so powerful in the Jewish community. This was another thing that we learned that day. Immediately after visiting the Holocaust Museum, we visited the chief rabbis of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And in our conversation with them, even though the words weren't spoken, uh, we could we could hear how deeply the memory of the Holocaust was mm. in the very fabric of their being. And, and that, again, was something I had not understood as deeply as when we spoke with them in person. So there's the awareness, uh, growth in awareness of just learning more history, mm -hmm. being uh, made more aware of things which have already happened and that have become chapters in that long story uh, that bring us to today, but then also the awareness of the real depth of feelings, of uh, the complexity of emotion and um, anxiety and all the things that, that make up the present circumstances that become that, um, if I can borrow from the Greek analogy, the Gordian knot that yes. becomes so difficult, if not impossible, to somehow yes. rather begin to loosen, let alone untie. Right, that's right. And so in our conversation with the chief rabbis of Jerusalem, it seemed to us that it, it would be possible to think about the current situation with the wall and the Palestinian population and all that which is our current history as some distance mm -hmm. from the history of the Holocaust. And yet what we discovered was that uh, that distance was not there at all. It was still very much alive, very much present. Um, as you got to meet with people who actually are living on that territory and who are experiencing that, that depth of the reality of it all um, on an everyday basis, how did you feel they related to you as, as visitors, as someone who was inquiring, who wanted to know more, who was open to, to hearing what they had to say? Um, how did they come across? They were very welcome. Everyone that we met was very pleased that we were there, and we were hosted very well and, and really felt welcome. And it's interesting because I don't think that there was any intentional distinction between the personal welcome that we received and the uh, very deep resistance to the idea of uh, freedom and, and uh, even, even hope for a new and different future that we hope to speak. And, and yet we discovered that that was the case. Uh, one of our experiences, too, and this, this again points out that very thing, in the Ministry of the Interior, uh, we had an opportunity to ask questions and, and to learn about uh, what, what their work was and their concerns. And it seemed to us very canned. And uh, afterwards on the bus, we said, didn't it feel like we weren't even being, being heard Mm -hmm. uh, that it was all canned. And then we were told, yes, but remember that the very person you were talking to is the one who helped us resolve the tax problem for the Augusta Victoria Hospital. Mm -hmm. So there again was a personal uh, favor and a personal relatedness that seemed uh, almost distinct from the, 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 uh, the, the formed memory mm -hmm. uh, that we were up against as well. It's fascinating to begin to try to make sense out of these complex issues and uh, complicated relationships. We do have to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to delve into it some more. Very well. We'll be right back.